Skeleton Crew was Stephen King's second published collection of short stories, and today I'm going to take a quick look at each story and rank them from my least to most favorites from the book. Hi there, I'm your host, Mr. Doyle, and this is A Great Undertaking. Thanks for checking out this video, and if you're into Stephen King, horror content, bearded dudes in silly costumes, or all three of those things, please consider dropping a like and subscribing to the channel. Alright, so there is a lot to cover, so I won't take up too much time with the details. Skeleton Crew was published in 1985 and was Stephen King's 21st major publication in less than 10 years, beginning with Carrie in 1976. That is incredible. Anyway, over the years, King had accumulated a number of short stories, many of which had seen publication in magazines or anthologies, so in the same spirit as Night Shift, he collected and condensed the numerous stories into one collection, which is, of course, Skeleton Crew. Before we get started, I want to mention that there are a few poems in this book as well, but I'm rating them right along with the stories. Also, I didn't use a point system when rating these stories, and instead I just ordered them according to my overall enjoyment. There are 21 stories and poems in this collection, so I will be starting with my least favorite at number 21 and working my way down to my favorite story at number 1. Let's get at it. Number 21. Here There Be Tigers A young boy is in school when he needs to use the bathroom. He leaves the classroom embarrassed, but rather than head to the boys' room, he detours to the forbidden basement. There is a tiger down there, for some reason, and when his teacher comes to find him, she... Well, that's it, really. This story feels unfinished to me. It's, it's not entirely clear what the intended purpose or meaning of the story is, assuming there was one at all, and it left me feeling underwhelmed more than anything. My best guess interpretation of the story is that it is a snapshot of a fantasy being had by a child and a brief glimpse at some unresolved imagined scenario. The story, however, leaves much to be desired. Number 20. Cain rose up. It seems that King was channeling Richard Bachman for this one, and the story Rage in particular. He tells a pretty straightforward tale about a student who decides to snipe unsuspecting innocent people from his dorm room window. That's essentially the bulk of the story. The kid's motivations and goals aren't explored at all, which made this feel as if King was being gratuitous just for the sake of it rather than for any defined purpose. I'm not saying there is ever a good reason for this sort of seemingly unprovoked attack, but any reason at all would have been more satisfactory than not providing an explanation of any kind, which is what King chose not to include in this story. Number 19. Big Wheels A couple of drunk idiots realize the inspection on their rust bucket is nearly expired, so they drive with reckless abandon to the garage of a high school acquaintance to coerce him into giving them an updated inspection sticker. Once that task is completed and a great deal more beer is swilled, the inebriated goons get back on the road and shortly after get in a fatal crash. While this story was good for a few laughs and wasn't entirely boring, for the most part it was just a couple idiots being idiots and doing idiot stuff. There wasn't much in the way of plot and the majority of the story was inconsequential. I could have done without it, honestly. Number 18. For Owen. This isn't a short story, but rather it is a poem that King dedicated to his son, Owen. It's a short poem that predominantly compares people to fruits and, and the various characteristics of the people and the fruits they represent. This poem felt out of place in the collection, but that's not to say it was entirely without its charms. Number 17. The Raft 
A foursome of teenagers decide to go for a brisk October swim at an isolated lake. In spite of the frigid waters, they eventually manage to convince themselves to take the plunge with varying degrees of hesitancy. The teens make their way out to the anchored raft that floats alone at the center of the lake, and once on board, they notice an unusual, seemingly innocuous black patch moving across the surface of the lake. However, the, the, however, the patch is alive, it is sentient, and it is hungry. While I enjoyed the short story of the raft a great deal more than I did the version that was presented in the Creepshow 2 movie, this is still not among my favorites from Skeleton Crew. It's not all bad, but like the version in Creepshow 2, there is a terribly out of place sex scene that takes me out of the story and is just so unbelievable. I mean, two people are dead and there's a blob creature trying to eat you. Are you seriously having sex on this raft? How are you even remotely in the mood? That's not the only reason I don't love this story, but it's certainly the most prominent. Number 16, The Jaunt. It is 300 years into the future, the depletion of natural resources, poisoning of potable water, and all-encompassing destruction of Earth by its human inhabitants has caused humanity to search elsewhere for resources and for a more habitable planet. And thanks to a mad scientist of sorts, it's all been made possible by way of teleportation. Through experimentation and rigorous testing, the once dangerous, even deadly act of teleportation is now a safe and accessible means of transportation, but sometimes things can still go very, very wrong. The Jaunt is certainly more of a science fiction story, but it is not without its horror elements. The end of this story is particularly disturbing, and the premise, aside from the teleportation angle perhaps, smacks strongly of modern-day realities like man-made climate change, commercialized space travel, and late-stage capitalism. Number 15. Paranoid. A man suspects everyone and everything to be out to get him. He is likely imagining these things, these delusions, and we can't say for sure whether or not his suspicions are unfounded, but he sure sounds like he has lost touch with reality. Paranoid, rather than being presented as a poem, is referred to as a chant. It's a rapid-fire collage of every imaginable conspiracy theory and reads as a manifesto rant by a tinfoil hat-wearing loon, and I thought it was a fun read. November, November? Number 14, Morning Deliveries. The sun is coming up, the world is gradually awakening to greet the day, and the milkman, Spike, is going about his business making the morning's deliveries. Only, Spike is delivering more than just dairy products to some of the customers on his route. For some folks, there will be some unwelcome surprises left by this particularly malicious milkman. I enjoyed this story as it starts off so wholesome and seemingly uplifting, then pivots hard into something entirely different. King gives us the impression that all is well with the world, and then abruptly informs us that we are very much mistaken. Number 13, Mrs. Todd's Shortcut. Ophelia Todd likes to drive. More specifically, she likes to find the shortest route between any two locations, always challenging herself to shorten the distance and the time it takes to travel it. She shares her obsession with our narrator, Homer, who, after some light convincing, agrees to tag along with Mrs. Todd for one of her time-bending drives. While on their ride, in addition to the inexplicable shortening of distance and time, other unnatural things occur. Set in Castle Rock with references to other Castle Rock characters and stories, Mrs. Todd's shortcut is an enchanting tale that gives the reader just enough information to intrigue them, but never so much as to spoil the wonderment and mystery. Number 12, Beach World. A flight crew finds themselves stranded in a vast wasteland of sand. Low on resources and running out of time, a cyborg rescue team eventually comes to their aid. The sand, however, has no intention of allowing them to escape. 
While perhaps not an entirely original concept, Beach World portrays a dystopian future in which madness gradually encroaches while the chances of survival plummet correspondingly, and unseen forces work to claim the lives of anyone unfortunate enough to stumble upon Beach World. This story gets intense and the cyborgs were a bizarre but interesting touch. Number 11. The Wedding Gig it's 1920s Prohibition-era America, and a coronet player and his jazz band are hired, or rather they are forced to play at the wedding of an Irish gangster's beloved sister. Things go badly when a rival gang shows up. The wedding abruptly ends in tragedy, but the violence and rivalries are hardly the focus of this story. In this short tale, King manages to explore a number of topics, including racism, fat shaming, humility, and power. It's a great story that perhaps is more a social commentary of the era it is set in than it may seem at first glance, and that commentary retains a great deal of re re relevance even now. Number 10. Survivor Type a man is stranded alone on a small island following a plane crash. With no hope in sight for rescue and potentially life-threatening injuries, he is forced to take drastic measures. As time passes, his health and resources deplete. In his desperation, using the scant few tools and resources at his disposal, he begins to do things with and to his own body in an effort to survive. But his methods of robbing Peter to pay Paul lead him to become a fraction of his former self. This is one of the more gruesome body horror stories in Skeleton Crew, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a soft spot for this particular brand of horror. As much as I enjoy a psychological thriller, sometimes a messed up, gory, gross-out story hits the spot. Number 9. Uncle Otto's Truck after a disagreement regarding a business decision, one of the two men involved is crushed under his truck. While some suspect it was no accident and that it was his business partner, Uncle Otto, who purposely killed him, the townspeople and the reader are never entirely sure if it was the truck itself or Uncle Otto that is responsible. However, the truck eventually takes out Uncle Otto as well, and it's never clear whether the truck acted of its own volition from the start, or if the truck is possessed by the unfortunate business partner who is having his revenge many years later. King has written a number of possessed car stories, and Uncle Otto's truck, while having that premise in common with the likes of Christine, is a slow burner that takes a turbulent turn in the last leg of the story. It's seemingly a case of paranoid delusions coming to fruition, or a ghostly revenge tale. I'm unsure of which, though, and I like that approach. It leaves a lot to the imagination. Number 8. The Reach an elderly woman who has lived her entire life on an island has decided it's time to journey to the mainland. She waits for the water of the reach to freeze before starting her trek. However, her goal was never to reach the shores of the mainland. And she never does get to the other side. However, she finds what she was looking for in the frozen waters in between. This is a touching story that reunites loved ones in death. King explores the beauty of living a long life and taking solace in the fact that those who you loved and who have loved you and who have gone before you are indeed waiting to welcome you when you reach the end of your life. Number seven, Nona. A young man is hitchhiking in the cold when he stops at a diner to warm up. There is a strikingly beautiful girl there, and when she approaches him, he knows they were meant to be. Their initial encounter with the good old boys at the diner goes bad, and after a brief bloody journey to Castle Rock, we come to find that the beautiful young lady was not who or what she appeared to be. This story features some Castle Rock residents past and is a bizarre Bonnie and Clyde style love story of sorts, but by the time the story ends, it's not entirely clear if Nona ever existed or if she was a fabrication of our unnamed protagonist's deteriorated consciousness. This is another one that left me wondering at the end and led me to consider a number of different possibilities and implications from the story. 
Number six, the Reaper's image. A cursed mirror ends up in an unconventional gallery that might be considered a junk shop more than an art gallery or a museum. The mirror is a rare piece and a valuable collector's item. However, some who look into the mirror see more than their own reflections, and those who do don't typically survive for long following the experience. This is a story of unbelief and superstition, of an unwillingness to accept as real the things that challenge our preconceived notions of reality, and paying dearly for one's refusal to believe. The Reaper's Image is a short yet satisfying read. It's one of the few ghost, ghost stories in this collection, and while it's not entirely unique, it's a fun one. Number five. The Man Who Would Not Shake Hands A man with unusual mannerisms joins a poker game. He is adamant that he not touch anyone, including shaking hands. At the game's conclusion, one of his fellow players unexpectedly takes his hand to shake it, which sends this unusual man off the deep end. Turns out the man is cursed, and anyone or anything that touches him will face a terrible fate. This story is a direct tie-in with The Breathing Method from King's collection of novellas Different Seasons. We are returned to the seemingly enchanted men's club and a number of familiar characters from The Breathing Method make an appearance. Like The Breathing Method, King employs the story within a story literary device to tell a tale that keeps the audience both within and outside of the book wrapped and on edge. Number four. Word Processor of the Gods. Richard receives a bizarre, unconventional word processor as a gift from his recently deceased nephew. At first glance, the electronic gadget appears to be an innocuous Frankenstein of parts, but upon, upon using the device, it turns out to hold a great deal of power, and the words that are put into it manifest themselves in real life. Richard realizes the machine is breaking down at a rapid rate, and he races against the word processor's inevitable self-destruction in order to delete his old life and write himself a new one. The concept and execution of this story is excellent. King makes us sympathize with the protagonist even when he uses his word processor in arguably immoral ways. We understand why he does what he does, and despite his cruelties, we understand whether we like it or not. Number three, the monkey. A man and his family are haunted by a toy monkey. The monkey, no matter how hard the protagonist tries, simply cannot be thrown away, discarded, or ignored. And as if that wasn't freaky enough, when the toy takes it upon itself to work and its tiny symbols crash together, there are inevitably unforeseen consequences for the guilty and innocent alike. This story is unusual and documents a torment that spans decades. The monkey seems to represent a generational trauma that the protagonist is desperately trying to put an end to so that the curse ends with him, and I like that theme. But even without that analogy, the monkey is a creepy, weird little tale. Number two, The Ballad of the Flexible Bullet. An editor recalls a story that landed on his desk and his long-distance business relationship with the story's author, which devolved into a sort of shared madness. The author's paranoia, the author's paranoia and delusions somehow become contagious as the two men become paranoid pen pals, causing the editor to lose his own grip on reality. The two continue feeding into each other's worst impulses, and things eventually reach a breaking point, a point of no return, and only one of them remains to tell the tale. This was such a great story. It's weird and outrageous in all the right ways. While there are bloody, heinous moments, it's the unusual approach and the unusual subject matter that make this one of my favorites from the Skeleton Crew collection. Number one, The Mist. Following a powerful, destructive storm, an eerie mist rolls in off the lake and gradually envelops the town of Bridgeton, Maine. 
The mist is so thick and dense that it blots out Bridgeton entirely, but its coverage seemingly goes well beyond the borders of the small main town. The mist hides within it otherworldly, Lovecraftian creatures who the townspeople suspect may have escaped from a nearby, top-secret government facility. The monstrosities come in a variety of horrid shapes and sizes, however nearly all of them seem to share a common goal. That goal being indiscriminate destruction and bloodshed. The Mist is equal parts suspenseful thriller and intense monster horror. It gives the reader just enough character development to show us just who we're dealing with while never dragging or slowing down to dwell too long on the details. There is also some unhinged religious fanaticism mixed in with some Lord of the Flies vibes that I enjoy. The feeling of urgency ramps up page after page, building to a desperate fever pitch while the fates of our protagonists are left open-ended, leaving us to wonder just how bad things might have gotten when King concludes the story. There's a great deal more to this story than I was able to include in that brief summary, so I will be doing a separate video and a three video series just for The Mist in order to spend a little more time dissecting the story as well as its two screen adaptations. All right, that's it for the Skeleton Crew ranking. Um, the plan is to start The Mist series next week, uh, but my, my wife is having a, a major surgery this Friday, which it's Wednesday right now. Um, so it would have been last night for everyone watching now. Um, we're a little freaked out. Um, but it's going to be fine. We're going to be okay. I just, I, I will be a bedside nurse next week for my wife, first and foremost, a taxi driver for my children, secondly. Uh, and so I, I just am unsure if I'm going to be able to film uh, a video next week, but whether it's this coming Saturday, a week from today, or two weeks from today, uh, my next video will be for the short story, The Mist, so I can do a more in-depth look at that. And also in that series, we'll be covering the movie. And from what I recall, the movie adaptation was pretty good. And then there was a TV show and the TV show was less good. New videos drop on this channel every Saturday, hopefully at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So click the subscriber bell to get notifications and I'll see you soon. Okay, goodbye. Be sure to click like and subscribe to the channel for my continued analysis of all things Stephen King, pretty pleased with blood and guts on top. My name is Mr. Doyle and this has been a great undertaking.